You know, my, my story kind of comes, um, you know, I grew up wrestling in, in high school. I started wrestling when I was 10 years old in Virginia. And, um, you know, I, I was a little guy growing up, so I kind of used wrestling um, to, you know, to my, like, kind of self-defense. I was always a tough kid, but when I learned how to wrestle, it, it made me a um, hundred times tougher than I was already. And then, you know, I, I got really competitive. I was always a baseball player. I played a lot of team sports. And um, once I finally started wrestling, my, my competitive mode just went through the roof. And I started kind of becoming these guys that wanted to be first and wanted to be the best at every little thing that there was, whether it was like running, beating the, the school bus or whether it was running a sprint in practice or running a mile. I wanted to be the first. I wanted to be the best at everything. And, you know, a lot of that came through the toughness of wrestling. And um, that's where my, my base of fighting started. I started um, picking up little grappling lessons around people that I knew that did jiu-jitsu and did fighting and did boxing at the local LA Fitness. And I would kind of go up there and, and I would scrap with people when I was like 16, 17 years old. And my trainer, Saxon Janjira, he took a big interest in me because I was a wrestler. And and since then, Saxon took a real good interest in me. You know, I was really young at that time. I was like 17, 18 years old. Um, and I really fell in love with the sport. I really fell in love with it immediately. And I was trying to balance out fighting and going to college at that time. And then I kind of found myself like, once I started to learn how to fight and I came around this environment full of other dudes that liked fighting and we were these, you know, it got me in the real macho man environment. and. I stopped doing everything. I was skipping college and I was, skip, I was cutting classes just to come train in the afternoon classes and then I would come back and train at night. And this was just like, kickboxing was something I just absolutely fell in love with. And I, was, I wanted to be perfect. I wanted to be the best one in the gym. I came into the gym and I didn't want to see anybody that was like better than me. I wanted to be the best one. I wanted people to look at me and look up to me, just like I had looked up to people when I first walked into the gym. And then I got a couple of fights and Saxon was really into me and then you know, the rest is kind of history from there. I, 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 once I turned pro and, and I got my first few knockouts and then I kept knocking people out and I kept knocking people out, we heard for a long time that the UFC was looking at me and I just needed more experience. And then one day I had a fight. I had a fight in October and then I broke my hand and the UFC offered me a, a, a short notice fight right away, but I couldn't do it at that time. My hand was too freshly broken. And then they came back a couple of weeks later and they offered me another, another fight. And I was like, man, I cannot, I can't, I don't, I don't know how many times this time, type of thing is going to happen, so I cut my cast off and I went home and I, I, it, was, it was right at that five, six week period of being in a, in a cast with a broken hand and I just kind of said, fuck it. And I cut it off, and I started training and Saxon and I, my trainer, we worked nothing but right hands and left elbows and anything that we could do to win a fight without using that hand and that's what we did. And so we took the fight, we signed with the UFC and we kind of just took off from there. So when my manager called me and he's like, you know, hey, uh, can you make, he, the first thing he says, he calls me, he says, hey, can you make 125? And I, I kind of laughed and I was like, well, yeah, but I win. And he was like, next week. And I was like, for the UFC, I can. And then he was like, that's who it is. And it was like, it didn't seem real until I really got to Vegas and I really like saw everything because I kind of heard that the UFC was interested in me for like a year or a year or so or two years. And there was another guy at our gym that was in the UFC at that time and he came and he left and he, whatever history they have and you know it was just like it didn't seem like I was actually in there I kind of I kind of felt like I had just gotten lucky and I just gotten that lucky opportunity and you know they were really hunting after me and I, I've, I, I really see it now that they were really interested in me and it, after all that time they were just waiting for me to be ready for for that next step in my career and now that I'm here it feels like I don't want to go anywhere I don't want to I don't want to go anywhere but the hardest thing about being in the UFC is staying in the UFC Everybody's trying to get your spot. Everybody's trying to get where you're at. And so we used to have this guy named Burt Watson who would always tell us as soon as we got there, he'd be like, everybody's trying to get here. It's easier to get in the UFC than it is to stay in the UFC. And so when you have that mentality, you have to really keep that with you all the time. Otherwise, you can get caught up in, in other things and just the glory of being a UFC fighter. You have to be a certain type of UFC fighter. You don't want, you don't want just the resume of like, oh, I fought in the UFC. Tons of guys have fought in the UFC and never want to fight. I want to be one of the guys that's like here for a while. And I want this to be my career, my legacy, my life. You know, the UFC does have stars that they promote a bit more than the other ones. Um, 
and it's a, it's everybody's hungry, man. Everybody's trying to get that that money fight. Everybody's trying to get to that that highlight spot. Everybody wants to be the superstar. It's not easy to get there. I've been I'm trying to get there, but I mean, your your the the superstar the superstarness will come with your skills. It's not like it's not like you can just get there because they like you. You actually have to win. Like it's not easy to be. A Conor McGregor or Ronda Rousey or these other people—they ran through a ton of people to get to where they're at, and and that's what you have to do if you want to get there. And it seems like a lot of people say this and that about like, oh, it's about entertainment and it's about whatever. I mean, if you're winning fights, they're gonna promote you, and if you're knocking people out, they're gonna promote you. And that's my goal, man. I want to keep I want to keep the keep the knockouts coming. I want to keep the entertainment coming. If you're an entertaining fighter, they will bring you back and they will promote you, but. You know, like I said, everybody's hungry. Everybody wants to get in that spot. Everybody wants to be in your shoes. So you have to keep like you have to keep that motivation up. You got to keep that hunger up. You can't get comfortable ever. Football has been around forever. There's been a lot of fans of football for a long time. I don't know when football started, but it's the same with baseball. It's the same with soccer. These sports that have been around forever have much more wealth and much more money and much a much bigger, broad fan fan base than what new sports will do. The UFC didn't start becoming a sport until like a legitimized sport until like the mid 2000s. And some people will even argue and say that it wasn't until USADA and Reebok came in. But when when you're competing and you're comparing sports like that it's hard to like compete because boxing has been around that was one of the first sports ever and so it has like it has a history and it has like a reputation and it has like it has like a, a like almost drills right and it has and what i mean is that punches are thrown this way and entertainment is done this way and and promotion is done this way and it's the same way and the reason we know it's done this way is because it's been the same way for years and years and years and years and years. In MMA, we're still developing that and we're still learning about that. And it's the same when it comes to like the financials of the sport. So UFC, for, for fans in the UFC, they don't really know how much money goes into it because it's kind of one of those things that like, the UFC is like, oh, well, you know, we have a lot of money. And it's like, oh, but we don't have that much money. But it, they, they, it, it has to stay that way because it's a new sport. And with boxing, it's much different. The fighters are already aware of like, they're gonna make this much on the gate. They're gonna make this much in the pay-per-views. They're gonna make, they're gonna split the purse this way between each fighter. And so it's like, it's hard to compare the two. Boxing, boxing is a brutal sport to get into also, and it's a, it's a hard sport to get going. But in, if you make it in a boxing world, you will make it much greater, and you'll make a lot more money than you would right now in an MMA world. But I think that MMA is on the rise. I think the UFC is on the rise. The fact that, that um, Connor broke into this huge, crazy money fight, he's probably gonna make, I don't know what he made, but I'm guessing it's probably somewhere around $50 million. The reason that I think that will push us is because we just appealed to a whole new demographic of fans, right? Boxing fans couldn't tell you much about MMA fighters, vice versa. MMA fighters couldn't tell you, like, unless they're big fans and they're strikers, they couldn't tell you a whole lot about boxing. Like a jiu-jitsu black belt couldn't come to me and list, you know, who's the WBC world champion at 154. You know what I mean? He probably like, dude, I have no idea. But he asked me, and I know it's Charlo. You know, but I mean, the the fact that we got that McGregor Mayweather fight, it was that's why I think the pay per views were just going to come through the roof because we're going to have UFC fans and boxing fans. And now it's not like it doesn't usually go that way. Usually the boxing fans watch boxing matches and the UFC fans watch the UFC. And now we're going to combine both of those, and that's why we we got such a big rise out of it. And I think even the pay-per-view numbers, I think they're gonna start trickling upwards, and I think all our numbers are gonna start trickling upwards because we just appealed to a brand new demographic. It's like, it's like we went into the, to the Dallas Cowboys stadium during a, a Dallas Cowboys game, and we were like, look everybody, look at this fight. And we had everybody there watch the fight. Now all those fans are gonna go home and they're gonna be a fan of the fight now. They might not have been a fan before, but at least they're like, it's in front of them and it's like presented to them now, before it wasn't. So I think that's why it's going to go up and up and up from here. Man, you know, I don't get to see a lot of Dana. I don't, I don't see, I only see Dana usually during like events. I've seen him, um, 
I mean, I've seen him at weigh-ins. I've seen him at like like before, after the weigh-ins. He usually gives everybody a speech after the weigh-ins. But those are the only real interactions I've ever had with him. Um, I don't see him a lot with the with the fighters. Only like certain ones, like Connor and maybe other other people that he's a fan of. But I mean. I couldn't. I couldn't really comment too much about what it's like working with Dana because I. I mean, I've never really worked with him. I've only like fought in his promotion, and and I haven't really like had conversations with him. I've never. I've no, and I don't really know the other people that have other fighters that have. He's kind of like exclusive, I guess. So. Oh man, it was cool. I was training at the UFC Institute. Um, about a month ago, and I just saw. I looked over, and I saw Freddie Roach first, and I saw, and I was like, "What the hell is Freddie Roach?" And then I saw GSP right behind him, and I was like, "Oh my God, that's GSP!" And I knew they worked together too, and so I immediately fangirled out, and I like dropped what I was doing, and I went and asked him for a picture, and you know, I'm as far as his return, it was just a very interesting way to go about it. There's a lot of people saying that he took PEDs, and there's a lot of people saying this, that, and the other about him, but I mean, I look at it like this. George is one of my greatest idols, and it wasn't. It was. It was his technique that really got me. It wasn't. I didn't think he was a big juiced up fighter. He could have been taking stuff, and the way that the story looks, it kind of does look guilty, like he was taking stuff. But either way, he's not now. And GSP showed up on his worst day of work. He was out of work for four years, and then he's coming right into a five round title fight against the best in the planet. And he like the worst George St. Pierre that we've ever seen showed up. And he still walked home with the belt. And, you know, George is, um, he's definitely probably my biggest idol in MMA. His wrestling, his, his, his strategies, his, his, the way he fights and the way he approaches fights and the way he trains for fights. It's like, even his cornerman was like, it was like an all-star corner lineup that he had. He had just world champion jiu-jitsu guys, world champion kickboxers. You know, uh, Freddie Roach, who's trained like more world champion boxers than anybody on the planet, and, you know. It's just, I hope one day I can do that. And I hope one day that I can be able to afford trainers like this. And I hope one day that I can be in like the shoes like that. And I hope one day I can take a, take a four years, four year uh, day off and then come back and walk right through the title. Um, George St. Pierre is incredible, man. My favorite guys to watch usually are like in their each individual sport. My favorite MMA fighter to watch is probably, probably uh, Jose Aldo, or um, I like watching McGregor too. I wasn't, a, I wasn't a McGregor believer, but I like watching McGregor. Um, I like watching the Diaz brothers. I like, um, I like those grinders, man. I like those, those grinder type of fights. I like the tough guys. I like, I like Frankie Edgar. I like, um, Kickboxers, I like Sanchai, I like Giorgio Petrosian, I like um, I like um, Lertzilla, I like I mean these guys are just ridiculous. Um, uh, boxers, I'm trying to go through my boxing list. Probably I, you know I like watching Floyd, I like watching Pacquiao, I like watching Canelo. My favorite probably of all time is Chavez. Um, you know I've studied everybody. I've studied. Uh, 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 Pernell Whitaker, I've studied um, uh, Willie Pep, um, um, Samat Paya Karun is a, one of the greatest um, kickboxers or uh, Muay Thai fighters of all time. I and mean, I've trained with him. You know, he's come to Texas before, and I've gotten to train with him for like six months. Um, so, I mean, these guys are my favorites for sure. It's hard to get the fight scene going in Dallas because we have so many team sports. We have the Dallas Cowboys, the Mavericks, um, the Stars. We have, we have a lot of very dominant team sports that are either dominant in the past, dominant today, or they just have big names. And so, like, MMA fighters kind of get swept under the rug with all that going on, you know, because it's like people are more interested in, like, the popularity of the sport rather than having to be like, oh, he's a UFC fighter. And, you know, I get questions asked all the time, like, oh, what do you get paid? Or do you even get paid? Or you know, you would never ask a Dallas Cowboy. Oh, do you guys get paid for playing football in front of the fucking national TV? You know, <laughs> and it's like obviously. So and it's kind of like the same thing for us. It's like, well, I fought on Fox Sports One, and they're like, yeah, did you get paid for that? I'm like, you think that I fought on Fox Sports One and didn't get paid? Um, <laughs> so I think we. It's been hard for for promotions to get going in Dallas. There's been a lot of shows that have come. They started a great show, and then they they close up because. Like I said, we have so many like big name sports around here. It's hard to appeal to and get the local 
fighting going. And there's been a couple of promotions, Legacy, XKO, and, and whatnot that have they've been able to to stick around. But they're they're very good promoters. They're very hard workers, and it's kind of different than a lot of the other promotions that have came, put on two shows, and then they they're done. Um, and I think that I think that my personally, I think that that's because we live in such a team sport area. If we lived somewhere like like Las Vegas is the fight capital of the world, but they just now got uh, a hockey team, and I think maybe you know. NFL and other things are going to start taking over, but that's a that's a much easier place for an individual type of sport to take off because there's not a lot of team sports going on. Plus the gambling out there, and um, you know, boxing boxing probably is a little more popular in Dallas than UFC is because we've had Earl Spence come through. We've had some Manny Pacquiao's fought at the Cowboy Stadium twice. Boxing is a step up a bit above MMA, but I mean. We have some fighters. We've had a, we've had a few fighters come and go in Dallas. Now we had Johnny Hendricks, who was out of Fort Worth, who was a UFC champ. So I mean, it's on the rise. I think MMA is on the rise, but um, it's hard to compete. And it's hard for boxing and MMA to compete with, you know, Jerry Jones. And it's hard for them to compete with um, um, who's the Mavericks owner, Mark, um, Mark Cuban. And it's hard for the, these guys are absolute billionaires. These guys are, they have the money and they have the backing and they have the history behind the sport to push it a lot more than what other XKO and Legacy has. So I think that the, the cities that have the bigger team sports areas, I think it's harder for fighters to get that popularity because we do have like everybody. We have Dirk Nowitzki, we have um, we had Tony Roma, we have tons of guys that were super popular players, Terrell Owens that were out of Dallas. So it's like, who would you rather go meet? T.O. or Ryan Benoit. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm a UFC fighter, but, you know, it's hard to compete. I think that's, what, that's all it really is. I think that that's kind of what makes fighters fighters, and I think that's what makes good fighters uh, who they are. I think is that, that whole ring approach and that whole panic and that whole situation, because it's like you have to, you're a different person from when you are in the, in the gym than you are when the ring, and then fights will be won and lost during that walkout. There's plenty of guys that like, they call it like the UFC jitters, your first UFC jitters, and it's that walkout, it's that like big moment, it's the bright lights, it's everything that's in front of you. And I think the guys that can really like hide those nerves and they can, they can tuck that feeling away are the ones that perform better. I think that, I think that Conor McGregor and the Diaz brothers talk so much to kill out those nerves. And I, I love that, I think that they're like, they're rambling and they're rambling and they're in their, their opponent's face and they're getting into them because that helps them prevent from being nervous. And I think that helps them get in their comfort zone. And the more you can be in your comfort zone, the better you're going to perform. And so for me, that's how I try to do it. I try to tunnel vision. I call this my tunnel vision. And I'll repeat my game plan over and over again as I'm walking to the ring. I'm like, I'm repeating my game plan. I'm repeating my game plan. I know what I'm going to do. And then when I get in the ring, I make sure that I'm not, I'm not getting my adrenaline dump. I don't want to run across the ring. I don't want to get too too amped up and too hyped up because you'll get an adrenaline dump if you don't knock them out in the first minute. And for me, it's taken some experience because I fought, I fought five times in the UFC now, and each time it's different. Each, the first time I walked out, it was like I was starstruck. And when I saw my opponent in front of me, I tried to kill him. And I didn't really get an adrenaline dump. I was there to fight. But then, like, second fight, I fought a really tough opponent. I fought somebody who was a big name in front of my hometown. The nerves were, were there, but, like, once the fight interacted and once I got hit in the face, it's like, your tunnel vision comes on and your fight mode comes out and your inner personality comes out. And that's when you can see like how somebody's true personality is. How are they gonna react when they get hit? Are they gonna take a step back or are they gonna go forward? Are they gonna panic wrestle or shoot in? Are they gonna fight? And and once you once you get in there and you've experienced this, you'll figure out what that's like and you'll figure out like, oh, what works best for me and what's gonna be best for me. And um, that's what I my take is on on getting in there. My my the part I hate the worst is the walkout and the announcement and everything. I wish we could just like, okay, I'm warmed up in my locker room, let's get in the ring, let's fight. Fuck all the announcement. I don't care about hearing a record. I don't care about any of this. I just wanna go, I just wanna go, I just wanna go because like, the longer it takes, the more built up it gets and the more anxiety it gets, the more you're thinking about the end result. And it's like, no, 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 I just wanna fight, I just wanna fight, I just wanna get in this process. I just wanna go, I wanna go, I wanna go. And for me, that's how I, I get it. I tunnel vision all the way until I get in the ring. Once I get in the ring, it's on. 
you can't think about that. I think that's in, I think that's with most fighters, and the ones that are thinking about that aren't gonna do well. You can't play scared. You can't fight not to lose. You gotta fight to win always. And the moment you start fighting not to lose, you're gonna lose because it's like whatever. Like I said, whatever you're, whatever you're afraid of, when you when you kind of let that guard down and you you kind of worry about being afraid of it, it will take over you. And if I'm worried about getting hit in the face, I'm probably gonna get hit in the face. And if I'm thinking more about him hitting me in the face than I'm thinking about him hitting him in the face, he's gonna hit me first before I hit him. Um, so it's like, you can't think about getting hurt. You can't think about, this is something that you can probably think about when you go home at the end of the day. It's like, well, did I get my bell rung today? And it's like, yeah, I guess I did. But until those signs start really showing up on your body, you, you, you don't really like go that route. And until like, until you start like, forgetting in the middle of your sentence when you're talking or whenever you start um, whenever you start worrying about the injuries, it's gonna happen. If you're worried about your nose getting broken by getting punched in the face, your nose is gonna get broken. You know, your adrenaline's kinda going so much and your mind's so focused on on something that when injuries happen you don't you don't even notice them. I've 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 broken, you know, I've broken my hand in a fight and I kept smashing my broken hand against the guy's face because I had, he's trying to kill me. And like, even if I'm not dead, I can, as long as I'm not dead, I can still go. And, and as long as I'm still moving, I can still go. And it's, um, you just, you just fight until the fight is over. That's, that's the way I look at it. And, and you might be able to beat me in a fight, but it ain't easy. And you're going to feel me. You'll feel all of me. And, and you'll never get through a fight without that. I knocked out Sergio Pettis in uh, UFC 185 in Dallas, and I was a 5-1 to one underdog. And I hadn't fought 16 months. I'd just gotten over a torn bicep. My left bicep rolled up into my shoulder. And um, I was being thrown into the wolves. It was Sergio Pettis' first fight down at 125. He was a UFC 135-er, and he made it public. He wanted to start going down. And the UFC offers me Sergio Pettis, and I was like, hell yes, I'll fight that guy. And his brother was the champ at that time. And... It was a very emotional camp. It was a very emotional time. It was, a, it was a hard fight. I hadn't won in the UFC yet. I felt like I was getting a tough opponent. I was this crazy, ridiculous underdog to where like, people and friends and people that were close to me were kind of like, oh, I want to bet on the fight, but, but, and I'm like, what? But what? Go bet on the fight. And tons of people were, were thinking that I wasn't going to lose and, or that I wasn't going to win. And um, I even started seeing a sports psychologist for that fight because it was like a lot of stuff was getting in my head and I wanted to make sure that I did every little bit of training that I could do in the gym, outside of the gym, at home. So I started seeing this sports therapist to help me get my mind right. And when, I, when the moment that I knocked out Pettis and the moment I put him down and I started smashing him, um, it was like, you know, it, I can't really say it was anything different than I'd already done. I'd been in this situation before. I'd hit people before, and it was like I didn't want to stop hitting him. I was in my my kill mode. I wanted to see his brain on all over the floor. I wanted to see him like I wanted to see him lifeless on the floor. And I wanted that I wanted that to happen because I wanted to turn around and say fuck you to everybody that doubted me. I wanted to turn around and I wanted to be like, you see what happens when you doubt me, and you see what you see what I can do. And I learned a lot about myself in that fight. And I learned a lot about everything, you know. He, he broke my face in the first round. He shattered my cheekbone with an elbow in the first round. But I knew he was going to beat me in the first round. I knew he was, I was going to lose the first round. I prepared for eight weeks to lose the first round. I knew this was going to happen. And I knew his feet were going to slow down in the second round, and I was going to bust him up. And that was my plan. I wanted to walk in. I wanted to get close in the second round because I knew his feet were going to get flat. In the first round, he kept his feet real hot, real hot. He was real in and out, in and out, and he was super fast. And... Things didn't go as good as I wanted them to go in the first round, but I got through that tough first round. And in the second round, I walked him down and I put my foot up his ass at the end of the fight. And, and that was like the, one of the most savage moments ever recorded, but it wasn't like something I had never done before, in a sense. I'd been there before, I'd knocked people down before, and I'd went into kill mode before, and it just happened to be Sergio Pettis. And I just happened to be a 5-1 underdog.